Hi everyone, my name is Rich Mulford and I will be visiting the University of Dayton on January 28th to interview for an assistant professor position. In preparation for that visit, I'm providing you with a presentation of my current and future research activities. I'm sorry that I can't take your questions as you watch this presentation, but I encourage you to ask any questions about my research when we have time to meet during my on-campus visit. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from BYU with my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering in 2014. I'm a current PhD student at BYU in Provo, Utah. I'm currently putting the finishing touches on my dissertation, and I will graduate in April, and then I'll teach here at BYU as an adjunct for the summer term. As an undergraduate, I worked part-time through semesters and the summer as a junior engineer at Novatech. It's a company that developed underground drilling tools. Before I started working with Dr. Brian Iverson, my current PhD advisor, as an undergraduate. As a grad student, I worked the first year of grad school as a teaching assistant and grader. But since 2015, I've been funded with the NASA Space Technology Research Fellowship. As a part of this fellowship, I've spent every summer over the last three years working as a visiting technologist at NASA centers or other government labs. My first appointment was in the thermal group at NASA Goddard in Maryland, where I used software and hand calcs to perform thermal modeling of an atomic layer deposition reactor. Next, at the Space Vehicles Directorate of AFRL in New Mexico, I helped upgrade vacuum systems and perform radiative surface property measurements um, using reflectometers. Finally, this last summer was spent at JPL in California, where I used software modeling tools to develop a CubeSat concept that achieves near cryogenic temperatures using a passively deployed radiation shield. So today I'm going to spend about 20 to 25 minutes discussing my past and current research work pertaining to deployable surfaces for spacecraft thermal control applications. <laughs> I'll then discuss how I would expand my current work as a faculty member at the University of Dayton and descri describe several new projects that I'd like to explore. I'll then identify possible collaborators there at the University of Dayton and talk briefly about funding mechanisms. So let's get right into the research. Spacecraft radiators, uh, like those pictured here on the International Space Station, are surfaces which are designed to reject waste heat loads into space. These radiators have a fixed size and emissivity, and they operate within a defined temperature range. As such, they emit about the same amount of heat at all times. Given this fact, radiators are sized large enough to emit the largest heat load that a spacecraft will experience. When the spacecraft is experiencing large heat loads, such as when it is in full sunlight or all of the electronics are operating, the radiator behaves as it should. However, when the spacecraft enters the shadow of the Earth or electronic systems are turned off, then the radiators, radiators emit too much heat into space, causing the spacecraft to drop below survival temperatures. To fix this issue, there are survival heaters on board the spacecraft which activate and keep the temperature of certain spacecraft components above a defined set point. This is often referred to as cold biasing. This method works, that's why it's been used for over 50 years, but the heater's thermostats and additional battery and solar panel weight require about 10% of the spacecraft's weight budget. Likewise, full heater power on average consumes 10% of the power budget. These power and weight might have been used to power scientific instruments or telecommunication arrays. <laughs> These costs motivate, uh, motivate us to ask the question, what if we could control radiative heat transfer directly? So that brings us to the idea of dynamic radiative control, or real-time variation of surface radiative properties or participating radiative area. <laughs> During scenarios with large waste heat loads, we want to encourage heat rejection by increasing emissivity or increasing surface area. Conversely, when in the presence of small waste heat loads, emissivity and surface area would be decreased. This could lead to an ideal power savings of almost 90% when in survival heating mode. So to this end, several devices have de been developed, including devices which alter their radiative thermal properties, like electrochromic or thermochrotic coatings, or devices which use passive actuation materials, like shake memory alloys, to control radiator surface area as a function of, function of temperature, like I've shown here in this picture. For deployable surfaces, 
Large variations in surface area provide significant control of radiative heat transfer, but how do we increase the total variation in surface area? So that's where origami comes in. Origami tessellations, or repeating fold patterns, provide a framework by which surfaces with significant variation in surface area might be synthesized. <coughs> Sorry. Origami tessellations provide patterns that may be stored easily on board a spacecraft. Likewise, origami is gathering space heritage as more and more projects turn to origami to solve packaging and deployment challenges. And most importantly, the idea of origami for radiative heat transfer control is so enticing because these surfaces provide control of both emitting area and rating radiative surface properties. So to demonstrate, as a finite origami tessellation is collapsed, the apparent emitting surface area of the device decreases, as shown in this illustration, which directly reduces the radiative heat transfer from the device. Further, as an origami tessellation collapses, the rigid panels form cavities, pictured here as a V-groove. As the aspect ratios of these cavities change, the ability of these cavities to emit and absorb heat likewise changes in a phenomenon known as the cavity effect. As shown on the left, a cavity geometry generates more reflection and absorption events than a flat surface of equivalent size, causing the cavity to absorb more thermal radiation than the flat surface. This increase in absorption is quantified with apparent absorptivity. Likewise, as shown on the right, a cavity geometry concentrates emission from its walls out of the cavity opening, increasing the emission from the cavity opening above the emission from a flat surface, which has the same emissivity and temperature. This increase in emission is quantified with the apparent emissivity. So my graduate work has been devoted to developing the field of active heat transfer control through manipulation of surface geometry. Ultimately, the work I've completed over the last four and a half years has helped to answer each of the questions I've listed here, progressing from validation of the actual phenomenon down to describing how this technology might be used in real application. So I'll now present my work related to each of these questions and demonstrate how my work has helped advance the field of thermal control through geometry manipulation. So first, is there a measurable change in radiative properties? The cavity effect is well known, but it is usually demonstrated with large black body emitters in the lab. Does a thin collapsible surface exhibit the same behavior? So it is, to this end, I devised an experiment. A piece of aluminum shim stock was folded into an accordion tessellation and exposed to thermal radiation from a laboratory black body radiator. An energy balance of the heated control volume yields this governing equation, which gives the apparent absorptivity of the surface as a function of temperature measurements, expressed here as theta. However, this equation also requires the overall heat transfer coefficient of the system, which is given here as U. So to find that value, a shutter was activated and the surface was allowed to cool. Rearranging the energy balance of the cooling control volume energy balance gives the overall heat transfer coefficient as a function of surface temperature, which is exactly the value we needed to calculate apparent absorptivity. So the results of our inverse model experiment are plotted here and compared with Sparrow's model. That's an analytical model for an isothermal V-groove machined into an aluminum block. As you can see, not only do our results compare fairly well with Sparrow's model, but we also now have experimentally verified that a collapsing, thin-walled V-groove does indeed experience an increase in apparent radiative properties. And even further, this change in apparent radiative properties is substantial, increasing by over an order of magnitude in this scenario. This work was published in the Journal of Heat Transfer in 2016. And to summarize the findings from this work, Apparent radiative properties do exhibit a measurable change for an actuated origami tessellation, so that's good, and the apparent radiative properties can vary over orders of magnitude. But the radiative properties are only one part of the equation. How does the changing surface area impact the heat transfer? So that is the point of the next question. 
How does the heat transfer change with actuation for an isothermal surface? I begin with an isothermal surface as an idealized step towards solving the heat transfer behavior of a real non-isothermal surface. So to determine the influence of a changing surface area and changing radiative properties, I generated an energy balance of an isothermal tessellation, which is subject to diffuse irradiation, which means radiative energy is entering uniformly from all directions, and collimated irradiation, which is radiative energy that enters entirely from a single direction. This tessellation is emitting energy to the surroundings via thermal emission. From this energy balance shown at the bottom, it is clear that we need apparent radiative property data in order to proceed. So to generate that data, we used Monte Carlo ray tracing. A statistically large number of rays are emitted from a given cavity geometry. These rays are either completely absorbed or completely reflected by each surface they encounter. The number of rays emitted, number of rays absorbed, and the number of rays that escape are counted. I then develop models that relate the number of escaped, emitted, and absorbed rays to the actual apparent radiative properties. And these equations are shown on the bottom of the screen. <clears throat> so we created a command line driven ray tracing application and then using billions of rays generated a massive amount of data using the BYU supercomputer. So to summarize a few of the most important findings, uh, v grooves with specularly reflecting surfaces, which is a mirror-like reflection, approach an apparent emissivity of unity as the cavity collapses, or as phi here becomes smaller. And that's regardless of what the intrinsic emissivity was. This behavior has been shown analytically previously. Um, also, the apparent emissivity and apparent absorptivity are equivalent for diffuse irradiation, so the left plot, irregardless of the reflection type. This is a result that had been hypothesized, but uh, never demonstrated. Finally, apparent radiative properties don't always increase as the cavity angle decreases. You can see that here on the plot on the right. Uh, so that's the first time this phenomenon has been demonstrated. So now that we have radiative property data, we can find the heat transfer for an accordion tessellation. So these two plots illustrate the net radiative heat transfer from an accordion origami tessellation for either purely diffuse irradiation or purely collimated irradiation. The plot on the left is behavior for a cavity that reflects specularly or diffusely, whereas the right plot only shows the behavior of a specularly reflecting tessellation. The heat transfer is reported as a scaled value capital pi, having been scaled by the heat transfer at a cavity angle of 180 degrees. So getting to the results, when irradiation is diffuse, so the left plot, the heat transfer continuously decreases as the cavity angle decreases, showing that the decreasing surface area is always dominating the increasing apparent radiative properties as the V-groove collapses to a fully folded state. In the same plot, we see that black surfaces show the most steady variation in heat transfer with angle, whereas very reflective surfaces uh, the curves with an emissivity of 0 0.2 shown here show the most change in heat transfer only in a small angle range on the left. Now, collimated irradiation shows very erratic behavior, especially when the surface reflects specularly. As seen on this plot on the right, short ranges of actuation angles, like I'm showing here, show up to three times variation in heat transfer. Since sunlight is essentially collimated irradi irradiation at the Earth, this effect may prove very useful for spacecraft applications. <laughs> so now, in developing the net radiative heat transfer model, it was necessary to make several assumptions. As such, I may, it made sense to experimentally validate our approach. <laughs> to this end, I placed a folded stainless steel shim stock accordion fold in a vacuum chamber and heated it to a nearly isothermal condition by running an electron current directly through the shim stock. By subtracting conduction losses, the heating power is equivalent to the net radiative heat exchange. Starting with the net radiative heat transfer model, we can eliminate the collimated irradiation term, rearranging the apparent temperature of the cavity opening 
is now given by this equation. Now measuring the temperature of a surface that doesn't exist, being the cavity's opening, is very difficult. To accomplish this, um, I imaged the tessellation through a sapphire window using a thermal camera, giving an image that looks something like this. So by setting the emissivity setting of the thermal camera to the numerically calculated apparent emissivity of the surface, the average temperature along this line gives the average apparent temperature of the V-groove openings. This result may then be compared with the result from the analytical model, and that gives us a validation. This experiment was performed for seven discrete fold angles over four different power levels, and here's our results. So open circles are associated with numerical results. Oh, sorry, no. Experimental results are open circles, and numerical results are filled triangles. So comparing the model and experimental results, the agreement is excellent. Uh, the greatest relative error between model and experiment is about 4%, and all results fall within experimental or numerical model um, errors. Uh, this work has been published as three separate journal papers, one each in the International Journal of Heat Mass Transfer, the Journal of Thermophysics and Heat Transfer, and the Journal of Heat Transfer, all of them within the last six months. So to summarize our results, Apparent radiative properties always increase as cavity angle decreases unless the cavity is a specular reflector and irradiation is culminating. Specular reflective surfaces exhibit large changes in heat transfer over a very small angle range, but their heat transfer values are relatively small. Finally, diffuse black surfaces exhibit changes in heat transfer over the full actuation range and have much larger heat transfer values. But remember, this is all for an isothermal surface. How does this apply once we have a real surface and a real application, something like a deployable radiative fin? So how does the heat transfer change with actuation for a deployable surface? To answer this question, I generated a somewhat scary looking numerical model, but I promise it's not that bad. This image depicts um, several rigid aluminum panels right here that have been linked by a flexible and thermally conductive hinge. This first panel is connected to an isothermal base, and it's treated as, uh, the base is treated as a point. Heat conducts along each panel and is emitted via thermal radiation. And this radiation either exits the structure or intersects with other panels, where it's then either reflected or absorbed. So I subdivided this structure into a finite number of control volumes and performed an energy balance on an example control volume, um, as shown here in blue. <coughs> and depicted mathematically at the very top. Um, so we have several terms. Conduction heat transfer terms. I used a numerical approximation of Fourier's law. For the radiation terms, I summed up the emitted and the reflected thermal energy, which is the radiosity, incident on the control volume of interest from all control volumes on the opposite panel. And I did this for both sides of the control volume of interest. Then finally, I modeled the emission from the control volume just using the Stefan-Boltzmann law. Okay, this gives us a final governing equation that I non-dimensionalized. And one equation was written for each control volume, giving this matrix. An iterative method using the Thomas algorithm to solve the system of equations produced a solution after an initial guess was made for temperature and radiosity profiles. So, a quick look at the results. The metric of interest used in the field to describe variable spacecraft radiators is the turndown ratio, designated here as capital Psi. And that's the ratio of the largest possible heat transfer to the smallest possible heat transfer. A device with a large turndown ratio can vary its heat transfer significantly, which is what we want, whereas a small turndown ratio indicates very little possibility of control. <laughs> So our left plot gives the turndown ratio of a radiator with four panels as a function of the radiator panel geometry and material as expressed by the conduction radiation interaction parameter, which I give right here. From this plot, we learn that the best panels for maximizing turndown ratio are thin, not very long, thermally conductive, and coated with a black finish. Likewise, the right plot shows that increasing the number of panels which is NP on the horizontal axis, um, increasing the number of panels in the radiator can increase your turndown ratio for a given panel geometry, again expressed by NC. But 
there's an optimum number of panels, meaning that you actually can add too many panels, something I found very interesting. Uh, so this modeling work will be submitted to the International Journal of Heat Mass Transfer in a matter of weeks. To summarize, there's an optimal number of panels which must account for the thermal hinge resistance, the panel length, thickness, conductivity, and emissivity. We also want panels that are thin, but not too thin, not very long, highly conductive, and that have a high emissivity value. So now, let's put all this together and make an actual functional device, which is question four. How is this even going to look when we utilize it? Okay, so <clears throat> we've developed a deployable radiator prototype utilizing an aluminum support structure shown on the bottom left that's actively manipulated by a stepper motor. Solid aluminum panels coated in a specialized paint are connected via a lab-made thermal hinge which provides flexibility and conductivity. The purpose of this prototype was to demonstrate the viability of an actively controlled radiator. As such, the components have not yet been optimized for performance or designed to account for the harshness of the space environment. To demonstrate the functionality of our device, the first panel was attached to a heated aluminum block. This block represents a temperature-sensitive component on a spacecraft, such as a battery, and the heaters provide a simulated waste heat load that the radiator must reject. This radiator was placed under deep vacuum in a chamber at NASA Goddard, with walls and platen cooled to 173 Kelvin. The heated aluminum block was insulated such that all generated heat was emitted via radiation from the radiator. So to demonstrate the radiator's capabilities, the power of the heaters was varied by a PID controller such that the block temperature always remained at 293 Kelvin. After pumping vacuum, the radiator was positioned at its largest angle and the heater power and block temperature were allowed to come to steady state, at which time the heater power and radiator position were recorded. The radiator was then actuated downwards. As a result, the heater power decreased in order to maintain the block temperature at a steady 293 Kelvin. The radiator position and heater power were again recorded. We did this for a series of predetermined angles. Now as a base case, the radiator was then actuated back to fully extended and the PID controller was removed from the heater. Leaving the radiator fully extended, the heater power was set to each of the measured heater powers from the previous test and the final temperature of the block was recorded. This was done for each measured heater power value and this test is supposed to demonstrate the behavior of a state-of-the-art flat radiator that doesn't actuate as a function of heater power. Okay, so in the results, we see that the radiator maintained the block temperature at 293 Kelvin, which of course it did because we were using a PID controller. However, this data, the squares, the red squares, is equivalent to the data that would have been determined if the control scenario had been inversed, where the, p the heater power had been set to predetermined levels and the radiator position was changed dynamically in order to achieve temperature control. The PID controller on the heater was simply used to speed up testing time, since steady state takes about six hours to retrieve for every data point, and we only had a week to test. As such, we see that an actively controlled radiator is indeed capable of very tight temperature control. We also see that the flat radiator was unable to maintain the block temperature as was expected. Instead, the block temperature dropped by 23 Kelvin in application, this change in temperature would have been accounted for with continuous heater power on board the spacecraft. We also see how the position of the radiator changed as a function of power. As the radiator collapsed, the radiator power decreased as expected, which demonstrates the ability of the device to dynamically control its heat loss. From this data, we have determined the turndown ratio of our device currently to be 1.3, which honestly is not really that great. Uh, but you can see from our data that our test had to stop at a radiator angle of 37 degrees uh, because of mechanical difficulties. If we had tested down to a radiator angle of, say, 10 degrees, our numerical model estimates a turndown ratio of 3 for our device, which is much better. Uh, this work, I should mention, will be submitted to the journal Applied Thermal Engineering within about one to two months. So to summarize, um, conclusions from this capstone experiment. 
Control of radiator geometry enables temperature control using standard materials and simple control mechanisms. Um, these are all things NASA has done before. Collapsing radiator geometry conserves heater power after an initial power investment in actuation. Uh, likewise, something cool, this technology may be scaled up or down as necessary. And we've achieved a turndown ratio of 1.3, but uh, I believe up to 3 is possible with this simple non-optimized geometry. It could get even better as we work on making the best radiator. <laughs> Which, of course, brings us to what I'm excited about, future work. I'm going to present today near-term projects and also long-term projects. These will entail aspects of many mechanical engineering fields, including controls, kinematics, heat transfer, building energy science, optimization, materials, product design. And as such, I think um, there are significant collaboration opportunities. So first, I want to use the numerical model I created to optimize the panel dimensions and the number of panels using heat transfer per unit weight of the device as the objective function and constraining the panel dimensions, materials, and hinge materials to spacecraft industry accepted values. Likewise, um, my previous vacuum demonstration used a PID controlled heater where the radiator position was the independent variable. As a result, we could only demonstrate steady state control and we weren't exactly matched to how this would be used in reality. So <clears throat> what I want to do moving forward is demonstrate real-time active control by now using a PID controller to manip manipulate the position of the radiator in real time as opposed to the heater power. And the heater power now will independently rise and fall. This demonstration will duplicate exactly the usage of this device in application. Okay, likewise, the radiator is governed entirely by variations in geometry. As such, this radiator could be combined with a, an entirely separate radiative control device that utilizes changes in intrinsic radiative properties. For example, the radiator could be coated with a vanadium oxide coating, which changes its emissivity as a function of temperature. Or it could be coated with an electrochromic film, which changes its emissivity through an applied voltage. This would be the first time that multiple radiative control methodologies are combined into one device operating in parallel. And that honestly is something I'm really geeking out about. Okay, now moving forward, I want to explore other tessellations beyond just the simple accordion fold. Things uh, like planar tessellations, uh, those are shown on the left. Uh, the Bredos Mars at the top left or the modified V groove at the bottom left. And these um, have special properties about them that are each interesting that I can't really get into right now. Um, even more exciting, I would like to move into the Flasher family of tessellations. Uh, two examples are shown here on the right. These tessellations unfurl in a radial fashion. They are easily stowed and would be easily incorporated into a CubeSat architecture. And as you see from these videos, they're obviously being explored for real applications right now. I see the industry leaning more towards these flasher-based radiators, and I would like to explore these. Okay, in other spacecraft projects, I would like to explore the use of fixed panels that form cavities. As uh, shown here, these, cav these cavities might be used as radiation shields or, uh, and also as radiators simultaneously. I worked this summer at JPL to develop this, the passively cooled deployable shield. Using deployed surfaces, I was able to show that a detector on board the spacecraft could be cooled to 120 Kelvin without the use of any battery power, which is exciting. Um, in defense applications, BAE Systems has recently developed an active infrared camouflage. It's a concept that rapidly heats or cools interlocking plates to create a different IR signature than the object currently is given. So I want to explore the use of actuated cavities to create a similar IR cloaking effect that is achieved simply through actuation of a surface, which would significantly reduce power requirements. As shown here on the lower left, variations in the V-groove angle of a nearly isothermal accordion tessellation results in a change of over 50 degrees Celsius to the perceived IR temperature of the object. It's a little hard to see, but on the outside parts of this image, the V-groove is very open, whereas in the center, it's nearly shut. 
and that's why we get a very different apparent temperature reading. So uh, by controlling the geometry of a tessellation like this, the modified B group, then we could control the infrared signature of an object and tailor it to match the surroundings or assume a completely different shape. Uh, this might see the technology shrunk down to micro scale. Even further into the future, I've always been passionate about energy conservation. To this end, I'm anxious to apply radiative heat transfer control to the field of building heat transfer. As I show in this animation, buildings, like satellites, are exposed to large variations in radiative heat loads, with changes occurring over daily and yearly timescales. However, like satellites, we often account for these seasonal and daily variations through powered temperature control systems, like air conditioning or heating, which is contained within the house. By effectively controlling and utilizing radiative heat loads, we could significantly reduce the power necessary to keep our homes in a comfortable regime. To this end, I envision the development of technologies <coughs> that more efficiently utilize thermal loads on buildings. These technologies might be stationary, passively deployed, actively deployed, or even assembled and disassembled by building occupants. These technologies might utilize geometry alone or be combined with specialized coatings or phase change material to provide active adaptation potential and active control of thermal mass. Um, these technologies exist already. They've been called climate adaptive building shells, kinetic architecture, dynamic building skins. There's as many names as there are technologies, honestly. Uh, they've been popular lately with architectural departments. Uh, my experience with deployable surfaces, origami synthesis, compliant mechanisms, and a mastery of radiative heat transfer principles leaves me uniquely, uniquely situated to make significant gains in this specific field. Now, inside of a building, radiative cooling and heating is beginning to see application. From large floor or ceiling-based systems to individualized devices, these technologies increase and decrease the temperature of a radiating plate or surface to heat or cool a small zone in response to the presence of individuals in that zone. Dynamic geometry technology might be used here to decrease or increase the radiative output of the device without needing to change the temperature of the device, saving the energy that would have been used to continuously change the device's temperature. Likewise, cavities formed by origami tessellations um, exhibit highly directional thermal radiative emission. Uh, this directionality may be tailored through geometry manipulation to basically point radiative cooling or heating surfaces towards designated zones. Uh, and that's something I'm really excited about. I, could, I see all kinds of applications here um, where localized temperature control is necessary. Anywhere from office spaces, individualized thermal control, uh, even to supermarket refrigeration. Okay, finally, I'm interested in developing thermal control technologies for underdeveloped communities. Most of these new technologies I've shown you even now are not feasible for use in low-income communities or underdeveloped countries. Using my experience developing products for rural Peruvians with BYU's Global Engineering Outreach, I will explore new technologies, thermal control methodologies, building designs, energy informatics solutions, and even lifestyle variations that financially restricted individuals might use to increase the thermal comfort of their own homes and reduce energy consumption. Likewise, I'd like to observe and report current thermal control methodologies of these groups. I feel that they probably have just as much to teach us as we have to teach them. So that brings us to collaboration. As mentioned previously, my work incorporates many different aspects of mechanical engineering, and I think that leads to significant collaboration opportunities. Here I've listed individuals outside of UD that I would work with as an assistant professor. Each person on this list has contributed to or expressed interest in my work, and I look forward to working with them in the future. More importantly, I believe there's potential for collaboration with faculty and research centers at the University of Dayton. I've listed here faculty and centers who expertise might be a good fit for certain projects based off what I could learn through you know, stalking your internet profiles and your publications. If you are interested in collaborating and have bandwidth for additional efforts, I would be interested in talking during my, during my visit on January 28th. 
Additionally, I'm always excited to get involved with other people's projects anywhere where I can be useful. If you feel that I could contribute to your work, I would love to talk to you about how I could help. Okay, last but not least, I've identified um, funding avenues I'm going to explore to enable my work at the University of Dayton. For the deployable radiator, I do have sufficient results to start applying for um, larger funding packages like early career faculty or early stage innovation programs at NASA, as long as the calls are receptive to my research. I'll also pursue funding for graduate students through the NSTRF program and for undergrads and graduate students through the Ohio Space Grant Consortium's um, SICHOP program or their graduate student fellowship. Finally, I've received indirect funding through the Goddard Center Innovation Fund in the past, and I want to explore these avenues again in the future. For new origami tessellation, uh, seed funding through the Ohio Space Grant Consortium's FRIGP program will help gather results for an application through NSF's Thermal Transport Systems Division. Uh, that division calls for projects that study radiation amplification, controlling, and extinction. Regarding building thermal control, the Department of Energy solicits funding through the Building Energy Efficiency Frontiers and Innovation Technologies Program, which calls for smart, tunable building envelope materials to enable significant reductions in cooling and heating loads. Okay, so my presentation is over. Again, I'm anxious to hear any questions you have about my work, and I'm especially excited to discuss any collaboration possibilities that you might have dreamed up while watching this presentation. And I look forward to meeting all of you on January 28th. Thank you again for listening.